let's go and build those relationships now with no sites. We have no sites in your borough and actually talk to them. Actually, you know what? What are the challenges in your borough? Why do you need more affordable housing? What type of housing do you need? Family housing? Do you need single housing? We're built to rent work here. We're built to sell work here. What do you think about public realm? Have those types of conversations because actually that's us showing that we are trying to understand what they want and what their motivations and their aspirations are so that when we do have a site, we know that already. We don't just do things for the sake of it. We're thinking, how can we make this the best place? How can we make more impact? How can we encourage and and support people to do more or to do things differently or to improve their life chances? So we're always thinking about those things and making decisions based on that. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Uh, Today, we're joined by Olide Obo. Executive Director at Socius. Privately owned and a certified B Corp, Socius is an impactful developer with a £2.2 billion development pipeline across the UK's fastest growing cities. They partner with institutional investors, leading architects and local communities to create inspiring and sustainable places while balancing profit and purpose. At Socius, Olaide is responsible for nurturing partnerships with key stakeholders, as well as growing the company's pipeline across the UK. She started her career in marketing and communications and has had a meteoric rise up the ranks. And in 2022, she was recognized by a States Gazette as one of the 50 most influential people in the industry. Olaide, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for that introduction. Not at all. Well, look, as an industry um, as a whole, we are fantastic at boxing people into particular roles. Mm. And in order to get into the industry, uh, we put parameters around people having to do certain courses um, and then get certain certifications uh, in order to progress their career. You've kind of torn that uh, that route up because you've had a, a slightly interesting route into the industry through marketing and comms. So can you just talk to me a little bit about how and why you got into to property in the first place? Yes, of course. So yes, I um, had a bit of an interesting route in, and I'll take a bit of a more of a step back actually from marketing and comms. So I studied sociology, um, and it was also because it was one of those options of I was either going to do history or sociology. But I was fascinated with sociology because I had a really good teacher who taught me A level sociology, and sociology was always about the society. It was about study of society and people. And I was always fascinated by people. I'm a massive people watcher. I can spend hours sitting in a cafe <laughs> listen. I love eavesdropping. I love trains, just hearing people's conversations and making up stories about people's lives. So I've always loved that. So sociology for me was a natural route. It was a natural place to go. So I studied sociology at university for my first degree. Um, and I loved the whole concept of how does a society work? How do people make decisions? What influences them? What motivates them? And, you know, how do we, you know, and you know, crudely, how do you encourage people to move in a different direction? So that's why, you know, when, when COVID-19 happened, I was blown away about how you can actually motivate people to, to make some interesting decisions about their lives. So anyway, that's an aside. So I've always been fascinated by people. Um, so when I finished my degree in sociology, um, I wanted to be a journalist. I was like, oh, you know, moving on from, you know, loving, loving working with people and being around people, I'll go into journalism. I got a little bit waylaid by, by the civil service um, because I, I, I ended up doing a, a summer internship at the home office um, working in crime and policing. Um, and I got asked to stay on a bit longer and it was such a fascinating role because my job was to go around all police forces across the UK and discuss their crime, crime statistics with the chief constable. So you can imagine it was like 20 year old me rocking up to a, you know, quite a senior person and saying, oh yeah, I'm here to talk to you about your crime stats and you know, your murder rates are going up, your burglar rates are going down. What are you going to do about it? And it was baptism of fire because they, you know, half of them wanted to murder me. Like, what, what are you doing here? Get out of my office. And the other half were willing to kind of engage. And I think that's when I really learned the, the ability to kind of work well with people, to kind of engage with people, to listen to people, and also to kind of get on the same page. Um, I'm, I'm saying all that to set up the fact that I had, you know, that was a really interesting part of my career. I worked in crime and police and then I went to work at the CPS as well. So follow that crime and policing story. But it's because I was interested at that time of how, how do people get into 
the wrong side of the, you know, how do, what happens? How do, what gets them into that part of, you know, into crime, into, you know, difficult circumstances? How do we then rehabilitate them into, you know, to in, back into society? So that really fascinated me. Um, so I did that for a few years and then I lived in Hackney um, and I, um, I, my local authority, Hackney Council, was advertising a job for a, a communications manager, but it was to work in the council and it was to work in a housing department. I knew nothing about housing, but it kind of ticked a couple of boxes because it was local to my house. Um, it, was, it was working for a local authority. I thought well, that's quite interesting because I work in the civil service and um, it, I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Um, so I applied for the job and then ended up getting a job, but I knew nothing about housing. I literally was completely ignorant. Um, and that was my baptism of fire into, into the industry. And that was, so your, that was your route that into That was property. my first route into real estate, you know. So Hackney Council at the time had one of the highest numbers of social housing stocks, about 35,000 or something, housing stock in, 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 in the borough. Um, and they were, you know, they, they were also looking at building more um, stock in, in, in the borough. Um, so I came into that, you know, going... What, what's this all about? You know, I was, I thought I was coming to do comms, but I eventually fell into real estate and, and, and have never looked back effectively. So did you have any family in property? Parents, Absolutely not. Uncles, Nobody. aunties, no. anything like I, that? I knew no one who worked in real estate. None of my family knew anything real estate. The only, the only thing I knew is I lived in a house, you know? So, and I had, no, I was clueless if I'm honest. Um, and so when I came into the job, when I, when I was blown away by the sheer scale of what, councils we're dealing with you know because they were managing properties and that was probably the big thing for me I walked in thinking they were managing properties but I, I realized quite quickly that we, were, we had to help and support people who are living in those properties that was probably the big shift in my and that's what that's probably what's kept me in in, in this industry for many 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 years now um because my child everyone I kind of dealt with or worked with was focused on the physical buildings it was about the asset you know we've got a you know we've got we got 15 buildings you know they were built in this time we've got to make sure that they manage and service over a period of time we've got to make sure they don't fall down all the kind of intricacies of building management but actually the, the things that I was more interested in was actually what about these people and how do we support them to thrive how do we support them to have a better quality of life and how do we make sure that the, the physical environment enables that to happen so I, I was having really interesting different conversations to everyone else in the room and I kept on thinking that's a bit odd what, why am I the only one asking these questions and that, that was again was a, a bit of a reality check in real estate for me as well. So really trying to understand, I guess, what your customer or your occupier, yeah. what their mindset was, what they needed from the yeah. asset and the ultimate yeah. landlord or owner, right? Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, at the time in Hackney, it was also about trying to change a relationship between tenant and tenant and landlord. So it was quite combative, you know, lots of people who were living in the housing that we were providing at the time didn't have a choice. You know, there were significant, you know, people with significant levels of deprivation who had no other option. They didn't choose to live in social housing. They had no choice. Um, and as a result, the, com the relationship could be quite, in t you know, antagonistic. Um, so I was brought on to help manage the communications. You know, how do we improve the way we communicate? But one of the big learnings for me was we also had to listen. You know, we couldn't just, here you go, here's lots of information. Actually, let's listen to what people's challenges are. Let's listen to what they need. And how do we make sure that we are addressing some of those alongside? We can't just, we can't just fix, the housing doesn't fix people. You know, it's part of a number of things that we're going to, housing is a, is, is a big challenge that lots of people face, but there are also lots of other challenges that people are facing, you know, and we've got to, as a landlord, we have a responsibility to make sure we not only understand it, because we've got to make sure we know it, but figure out how do we bring people together to help address some of those. So that's, that was a big learning for me. What what kind of kid were you at school and, and growing up? I was extremely nerdy. <laughs> um, I loved reading, um, but at the same time, I was very sociable. So um, I'm one of those people who thrives with being around people. I, 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 I don't, you know, I'm not someone who can spend time alone on my own. I love being around people. I love kind of the energy of other people, which is why I was always fascinated by sociology, studying people. How do they make decisions? What motivates what excites them? Um, but I was very nerdy. I loved reading. And, and, and I also have a very dual, dual um, upbringing. I grew up my, my early years in Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria. So I was born in Nigeria, grew up there, fast paced, busy, hectic, but lots of fun and lots of energy. And then I moved to London when I was 10. Uh, and that was a bit of a change of, of scenery because it was learning a new culture, learning a new environment. Um, 
but and 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 figuring out how I fit into if fit into this world. And I, I come from quite a big family, so it was quite a nice ease into to London. But I think that dual. Um, upbringing was quite interesting for me. But what what is fast, what is interesting for me is that I've always lived in cities. So I've always thrived on kind of the energy and the vibrancy and the the, the kind of fast pace of cities. So, yeah. So you, you kind of come at this from a, a people perspective and really just trying to understand mm. people's motivation. Like that's the theme so yeah. far in terms of your degree, your yeah. upbringing, yeah. Um, your working for the um, for the police or the, mm. yeah, interviewing the, the, the constables, chief constables, through to this early stage at, at Hackney. How did that role evolve and how did you, how did you progress mm. your kind of career at this stage? So I came in as a, to, to, as a comms manager, effectively. It was very simple. You know, how do we communicate with people? So I was responsible for things like writing a copy on a website, writing newsletters, going out to, 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 to you know, it was, it, was, it was very, it was a desk job. But I realised that I, that doesn't, that didn't excite me at all. I wanted to speak to people. So I was always the one going, if someone needed to go down to meet a resident on an estate, about, I'd be like, I'll do it. So I, I'd always be the first one wanting to have that face-to-face -face interaction. So I ended up spending a lot of time meeting residents and that's a thing of listening understanding what were the challenges and also what are the good things what do you enjoy about living in Hackney what motivates you and I was working in Hackney at a time when Hackney had been both voted the worst place to live by Channel 4 it was by and, and, and there was a big campaign around actually that's wrong you know it's it, you know it's a stereotype let's change a stereotype so I spent a lot of time talking to people and and I'm one of those people who I'll put my trainers on and I'll go in and you know I'll go to the cafe and have chats with the you know the, the, the ladies who are doing knitting on a Saturday morning or I'd pop down to an estate fun day and jump on a bouncy castles with the kids so I love that part of my job and I realized that that's the bit that people missed. People are, the, the relationship with the landlord was very transactional. And actually they need, they, they wanted the landlord to also just hang out with them, to have conversations, to feel like they understood their day-to-day their -day lives. And not, as I said, not just the issues, because we always get fixated with the issues. They also wanted them to celebrate the things that were good about living, working, celebrating, enjoying themselves in the borough. So that I became the person who was always like, oh, Elida will go and do it. Elida, Elida loves that stuff. But it was because I felt I got so much out of that for my job as a comms manager and effectively I rose through the ranks I became head of comms in Hackney and I managed a team of five people and, in, and, I, and I embedded that culture of we are not people sitting in an office trying to un, trying to write things and communicate with people via just via a newsletter we are we are the face of of, of, of an organization we are there to go and meet with people and change a relationship from just a you pay me a rent and I and I give you a service. So actually we're partnering together. We want to make sure this place is the best place for you to live in. So how can we work together on things? So we'd set up things like resident panels where we'd invite residents to decide, actually, we've got pot of money. How do we spend it? You know, what, what's important to you? Do you want a card gardening club or do you want a, a bike repair workshop? Or do you want to do you want us to have a just a party, you know, a summer party every year? And it was those types of things, giving trust to local people and say, actually, it's your area. I, I'm I'm actually a, a visitor here. So you you make the decision. And that kind of empowerment really went a long way. And for me, you know, I saw that there was a real um there was a there, there, you know, there was a real there was people people bought into it and people generally gave you more time and built trust and, and credibility when you, when you actually had a proper two-way relationship with So there's a material shift in oh, completely. terms, of, completely. In terms yeah. of that relationship, Definitely. which I guess from a, from a landlord's hat perspective, mm. increases value, increases completely. retention. Completely. Retention, um, trust, you know, people are more likely to, you know, you, you don't have to sit there dealing with 500 complaints a day because actually people are more likely to come to you if there are issues. There are going to be issues, don't get me wrong, but you're more likely to have a proper relationship and have a conversation about it rather than being this antagonist battle of you did this you haven't done this you haven't done that so yeah completely and so how did your understanding of real estate evolve at this stage was yeah. it still very residentially oriented or, de had it or had it broadened out no, it was very residential so when I when I became head of comms in Hackney I then went on to work on a huge estate regeneration scheme so Hackney had sold off um, a big estate in North London to a big house builder um and that came with some challenges. Similar, you know, residents were quite worried about what this meant for them. Hackney was saying, well, we've done our bit, it's gone. So I was brought in to kind of smooth some of those relationships to local people and make sure that everyone got what they wanted. House builder was confident that they could deliver this scheme. Residents were confident and trusted that Hackney had their best interests in heart. And Hackney knew that residents weren't going to kick off. So I was brought in to do that. And that was, a, again, a big learning opportunity for me. And then from that... Um, 
Hatton decided that actually what they wanted to do was to build their own housing, build their own social housing. So I, again, put my hand up and said, this is an area I'd love to do because I felt all the learnings I've learned from actually speaking to local, speaking to people and being right in there, understanding more what's worked, what hasn't worked. If we're going to create new places, we've got to, we've got to learn from, from what hasn't worked in the past and what has worked. So I came in and sat on a team, sat with the designers, the architects, um, the landscapers and started thinking about actually when we're creating a new, you know, new buildings or new places, how do we do that properly? You know, what decisions do we need to make now? You know, how do we make sure we've got the right space for young people as well as people who are older? How do we make sure that those two work well together? All those types of things that we learned from, you know, talking to people, engaging with people. So I brought that into kind of new development. So again, that was completely new for me because I'd always been, I'd always worked on existing stock with existing residents. Now I was working on how do we design new places and, you know, encourage people to come and live in those spaces. That was a completely new thing. It's much me. more development, planning, exactly. architect is, is that kind of skill set. And exactly. did you know that you were getting involved with, no. with that in terms of a career path or an not at all. Or... It was just an opportunity. I, I literally sat there almost as a voice of the people. It sounds like quite it's quite it's quite bold, but I was there as a all the art designers were in a room and I was there as well actually you know over in da 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 we've got this park it doesn't really work because it's a park for two to four year olds where actually the whole estate is full of teenagers how do we make sure that the play space we're creating has more longevity and it's suitable it's intergenerational suitable for all those types of things that I was bringing to the table you know with no knowledge at all of development and the complexities that it brings I was just going well you know can we do this a bit can we think about this are we going to have balconies can we make sure those balconies have privacy because people want to put things so those types of things certainly coming from a people's perspective um but I, I didn't know that I was getting into development at all I, I was just like I'm working in comms in a, in a local authority and helping to you know helping to build a relationship between tenant and landlord that was my that was my modus operandi and I and I really really enjoyed it and so I think we when we first met we kind of spoke about Top Boy uh, yeah. on Netflix and you know the, the, <laughs> yeah. the it, it, it it was a similar sort of situation to that, yep. certainly from... Oh, definitely. Hackney was... Because I lived in Hackney, I kind of understood the kind of the, the language of, of Hackney. But Hackney had lots of challenges and, and continues to, don't get me wrong. Um, it was it, it had a hell of a lot of deprivation um, and a long deprivation inevitably leads to crime, whether we like it or not. You know, And crime was a big issue and also a big... Um, lots of social challenges that came with that. Um, so alongside, you know, trying to... That's why I say housing is an a fix you know you've got other things that we've got to address you've got to get people into proper good work you've got to give people training you've got to have people with confidence actually in themselves that they don't have to go down a, a route that looks easy and actually they can take a route that might look harder but gives them you know better quality of life you know you can walk on the street and not feel worried about someone you know arresting you or being in trouble and you you know you can hold your head up high and be proud and I think when I also because of my crime and policing background I knew the consequences of some of this really small levels of, you know, small acts of issues that I saw day to day. So yeah, for me, Hackney was, Hackney had lots of challenges, but also there was so much, there was so much pride in people. People were really proud of what they achieved, proud of the fact that they grew up, they brought up their children there and their children have succeeded, proud of the fact that, you know, Hackney had one of the, some of the best parks in, in the whole of London, and but no one really knew. And there's so many things to celebrate about it. And, and for me, helping people to kind of really celebrate that was something that I loved. Yeah, and, and and clearly, you know, you're a, you're a social chameleon, and you can be thrown into a boardroom or a design meeting, or you can be on an estate, or you could be um, somewhere else, and you've got the ability to to engage with those individuals and really understand um, what their need is and what they're looking for, and then translate that. How did your how did your career and how did your your role in property evolve, and how did you how did you work out which which way to go, and how did that that work? If I'm honest, I didn't. I genuinely didn't. I am definitely someone who hasn't ever really had a path, a career path set out for me. Um, I've always been very opportunistic and always just been enthusiastic about something that I enjoy. So when I, I worked in Hackney for five years and um, when I was leaving Hackney, it was really challenging because of, effectively because of government cuts. Um, 
you know, we had, you know, the local authorities were faced with making significant cuts to their budget. And I got a bit frustrated at that. I just thought it's impossible to do my job properly with a team of people with this level of constant, you know, you know, at that level, you're constantly dealing with budgets. Um, and an opportunity came up. And what happened was I lived, I still lived in Hackney and I went on a, a bus tour of the Olympic Park. And I, you know, it was, I loved it. I loved the, the idea of kind of the Olympics in my doorstep was just a dream come true. And I'd always said, when I went on that bus tour, I was like, I'm going to work on this. I really want to work on this. So I kind of got to my network and I spoke to everyone I knew. I was like, anyone knows anything? I'd love to work on Olympic State, on, on the Olympic Park in some way, shape or form. And I was like, I'd do anything. I just wanted to work on it. I'd sign up to a volunteer. I was, you know, I did everything. And then um, coincidentally, um, someone I knew was working for uh, an RSL, a housing association, who were one of three partners on the, on the, um, working on the Olympic Village. Um, and they were looking for, they were looking for uh, someone to come and support them. So the company was called Triathlon and it was made up of two RSLs, um, Southern Housing and East Thames, we're now LNQ, and a company called First Base. Um, and they basically acquired half of their homes in Olympic Park um, from the government, local um, ODA, and they were, the homes were going to be obviously um, homes for athletes and then there will be long-term homes at, um, once athletes have moved out and the Olympics are finished. And they were like, oh, we've got this opportunity. And I remember going in and going, so what's the job? Like, really know it's basically we've got all these homes we're gonna have to kind of you know let and sell them and get them ready and create a whole platform for that but that's gonna happen in like a year's time um when the olympics are finished i was like oh okay so what is my actual job they're like don't worry just come in you know obviously i went through the whole interview process and it was at the moment at the time it was sold as a sales and lettings manager which i knew nothing about never done sales don't never done lettings so i was like well i don't really this is not my skill set yeah, i'm a comms person exactly i'm a comms person but okay let's give it a go um and i knew i had i had no interest in sales it's just not my skill set um but i i i my as i said enthusiasm and opportunity i was like i'm gonna go for it because i want to work on the olympic park um and within like three days, I was like, oh, this is an interesting role. So effectively, we had 1,300, I remember 1,379 precisely homes and were like 1,379 keys in a huge bucket. <laughs> and someone was like, yeah, all of those homes, you've got to go and make sure that all those homes are built to the spec that we were told they're built to. And you've got to make sure, and once that's all, you know, pick up all the issues that there are, and of course, they're going to be issues. Um, and then we, you've got 1,439 homes that are owned by Delancey and Katara DR. So you've got to build a relationship with them because we want to make sure this whole place is marketed as a place. We don't want you selling, them selling. It's all. And then you've got to figure out, you know, the, what process is, what platform are you going to develop to actually rent out and occupy 1,379 homes in a space of about nine to 12 months? I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So that, that began my journey of basically working on the Olympic Village. And for me, it was probably the best thing I've ever done because I learned so much. I didn't know anything and I learned a lot. Everything from walking into that, th you know, figuring out how to, it wasn't built to spec and having lots of arguments about it not being built to you know, working with Newham, Hackney, Greenwich, Tower Hamlets, who all had nomination rights for the homes. Because sorry, we owned a affordable home. So shared ownership, um, affordable rent, social rent, you know, 1,379 of those working with the council to figure out nomination rights to who could actually occupy the homes. Then actually meeting people and having conversations about, okay, you know, you're, you're top of the list. You could, you could occupy this home. Does it suit you? Can we work with you to make sure it suits your family, your, 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 your lifestyle? And then moving people in, managing the whole estate and running it now for the past 10 years, 13 years now. Completely, uh, you know, something that I'd never done before. But it was a it was a real learning experience, and I learned a lot. Uh, made some mistakes as you do, um, but I'm so proud of that project. I walk I I go to Stratford all the time. I walk around it. I'm just like, I, and I bump into people. I, I was someone I bumped into recently. Um, when we moved there, she was one of our like fourth or fifth residents, and her daughter was tiny, like literally just born, and she was ecstatic at the opportunity to kind of move in. She had this new baby, etc. 
And the child was like a teenager. And I was like, what? Like, that's the kind of, I couldn't believe it. Not only as she was there thriving, her, ch- her child was walking next to her in a school uniform. I just thought, wow. I mean, she, she doesn't know me. So I, you really I see the whole impact her. in terms of the work exactly. that you've, been, you've done. But it was, that's the, that's, that was the, that for me, it was like, wow, you've really, that person's life, you know, in many ways has been transformed, but actually they just look, they, they look like a really happy family, just walking through Stratford, minding their business. While I was just staring going, wow, you know, this is, a, this has been a real transformative experience. Um, and also like, I, look, I walk around Stratford now and it's a real place, you know, it's a real community. And that's one of the things, those are some of the things that we did right, right, right at the early start about how do we make sure we're not just putting people in homes. We, we really got people to get to know one another because people are moving in, you know, from all parts of, the, of, of London into a place together at the same time. How do we, and we really, we really got people together and created a real community. So I'm really proud of that project. So that was my kind of next role, role, role in property and learned so much from that as well. Did you have a mentor or have you had a mentor who's kind of helped guide you or point you in a particular direction? Or have you just, as you kind of maybe said earlier, just... It, just had the energy and enthusiasm and yeah, you know, that figure out ability definitely. part of you just to throw yourself in the deep definitely. end. Definitely. I think definitely. But I'm also one of those people, I don't have a, a mentor, but I watch a lot of people's careers and the way to make decisions. Um, I'm very, and I, 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 people call it your squad. You know, I have lots of personal mentors who are like pushing me into, in things that I know I'm not, I'm, it's not my strong point. But also I go and find people who are really good at it. So when I was thrown into a sales and lettings role, which I knew nothing about, I went to find people. I was like, like you, you, you know this much better than me. Help me, please. Give me some guidance on how I can do this. And that's the kind of stuff I do. Um, so rather than a strict mentor throughout my career, I'm always looking for people who can help me in particular places that I know I'm not strongest on. Um, so yeah. So that was your your first kind of introduction to First Base. Yes. How how did you officially join First Base, and what did that that yeah. look like? And, and can you just again the role? What did it look like? What were you brought on to do, and how did that evolve? So I was brought on to work on Olympic on the Olympic Village, um, and that was that was probably about obviously for, during the Olympic Games 2012. So I did that for about a couple of years, and then but I was working for First Base and the two hazard associations. <laughs> so when the project finished, when we occupied all the homes, I was like, great! I was so you know proud, great opportunity and I was like right what am I going to do next because it was quite a once in a generation they don't come around often another Olympic park um and I remember having a conversation with first base saying oh well kind of looking at what to do next and I'm like oh no you know you've got to hang around f- for other things and at the time first we were working on quite a number of residential development projects in London and one of the things that I noticed at the time was um the conversation the the the, the, the biggest challenge for developers is always you know acquisition planning start on site. Those are the three key milestones that we always have. We, we could acquire sites. We're very good at acquiring, but a planning journey became quite challenging. Um, and I remember saying to um, my my boss at the time that, why is it so difficult? And maybe because I came from a local authority background, I was like, local authorities, want it. they want to give you planning. I mean, that's that's what they want. Sorry. They, they, they actually want you to build this stuff. And they invest need, in the community. Yeah. And- but it felt like, Every time we'd have a conversation, it was very combative. It was like, we were on this side of the table, look for it, and we're fighting over everything. Like, you know, it's got to be five so, um, uh, affordable housing. No, not four. No, not six. And it was just such a horrible environment. And I remember thinking, why is this so difficult? I mean, surely it shouldn't be that hard. And I remember, and I, I know, in, very, in a very naive way of like, it just can't be that hard. Um, but then I remember, I remember saying to my, I remember my boss saying, "Oh, you know, give me an idea then of how we can fix this if you if you think you can do it." And I said, "Okay, I'll go away and give it some thought." And I remember saying, actually, I think the way we do, the way we approach planning, is like everyone else. We we have already made up our minds about what we want, and then when we go to that conversation with a planner, we're basically telling him or her, "Well, this is what I want. I want ten stories. It has to be two hundred units. It has to have." 5% affordable housing and no I can't give you this and because it, that's what my spreadsheet says to, to hit my, the returns from the capital exactly. that's going to fund it so so their, their back is already up and they're just going well what's the point of having a conversation or going for a process if you're already telling me what you're going to do so sorry miss or mrs developer bugger off because actually you're not giving me what I want you're just telling me what you want and I was like well that, surely that's not the way around it we've got to at least start the conversation with the planners or start the conversation somewhere where we can still influence that, they, they can still influence that decision. And it was like, well, it doesn't really work like that because by the time we acquired a site, we've already been made up, we have made up our mind what we're going to do. We know what we're going to do because we've got to make those returns. And I said, well, maybe why don't we just, you know, I think if we dedicate a bit more upfront time, 
I think you're, we can get planning quicker. And I was like, how? Well, I think because the conversation with the planner needs to start before we've acquired a site, not a pre-app. Brief, we need to build, and for me, it was like relationship building. This wasn't a transactional, com, you know, uh, it has to be a relationship. They need to know us and know what we stand for. And then we need to know them and what they need so that we can build that in right at the very start before we even acquire that, acquire that site. And we need to have a very long-term vision Absolutely. in terms of how this is going to work. Exactly. And we need to make sure that we get a buy-in from our investors because they're bought in because they know we will get planning. They're certain we'll get planning because it will work. And the long-term, long-term returns are protected. And everyone was a bit like, mm, yeah, right. It doesn't work like that. Planners are just difficult people. They don't really listen. They don't want to talk to you. And don't get me wrong. They're lots of, they're, everyone has different personalities. And I remember I said, okay, let's give it a go. We've got a scheme in Southwark. It was on Southwark Bridge Road. It was a mixed use scheme. Beautifully, we had a, we had AFK, uh, um, Arnie Fender Castellis' design it. Beautiful scheme. And I said, let's give it a go here. Let's go into Southwark early you know we hadn't acquired a site yet let's go in and build relationship basically what i said is we know boroughs that we want to work in because you know we work in london let's go and build relationships with southwark with westminster with camden with islington with Hatton. let's go and build those relationships now with no sites we have no sites in your borough and actually talk to them actually you know what what are the challenges in your borough? Why do you need more affordable housing? What type of housing do you need? Family housing? Do you need single housing? We'll build to rent work here. We'll build to sell work here. What do you think about public realm? Have those types of conversations because actually that's us showing that we are trying to understand what they want and what their motivations and their aspirations are so that when we do have a site, we know that already. So I, I did my roadshow. I went out because I, I st- stuff I love. So I went and spoke to lots of different people. So planning directors, development directors, development teams in local authorities. And because I think because of my local authority background, I knew the doors and t- the doors to knock on and I could use it. I've worked for Hackney. I know what your challenges are. And people were willing to talk. They were like, well, yeah, this is this is a real issue. I'm fed up with people coming and just going, here you go. It's gonna be it's gonna be 50 homes or nothing. And they were willing to kind of give us their time to invest up front. And most in particular, because we didn't have a site. I wasn't coming in going, well, this is a site I've just bought and I really need you to give me planning. I was just coming to have a conversation. And yeah, there was actually, no Trojan horse or there was literally no, just... And I was using it to gain knowledge, but also gain their trust and gain their, build a relationship with them. So that when I did have a site... I was like, John, we spoke six months ago. You told me some of these things about your about Southwark or about Lambeth or about, you know, whatever. And I know that this is a big challenge for you. Now, I'm looking at this opportunity now. And I think that based on the conversations we had, we can probably deliver a significant amount of residential. Some of it's going to be family housing. Affordable housing is a given. We always do it, but it might have to be shared ownership. We were, so we could have a conversation. And he was, and him, John or Jane, whoever it is, knew that, I've had that conversation with her before. She understands my challenges and my needs. She's already thinking about them in this site already. So that when we get to planning, we've we've had those conversations already. It's not combative. It's much more relational. And I thought, oh, if I'm honest, I wasn't convinced myself. I thought, well, let's see if it worked. But I, I thought that had to be the right way because the way we were doing it before wasn't working. Um, so this Southwark site, we, we gave it a go. We did that with Southwark. We, did, we, we put all the right ingredients into the scheme. And then it was time for planning. And we went to plan it. And plan it, Southwark is not an easy planning route. Um, and we went to plan it. I remember it was a hot summer's day. And we sat there and we looked around and thought, Where's everyone? Like, you know, we're expecting residents, people coming out, you know. Within 30 minutes, we've got planning, we're out of there. We thought, what? So, of course, we're like, well, let's give it a go in Merton. We had another scheme in Merton. Did the same approach, got planning. Okay, let's give it a go in. Um, we had another scheme in um, uh, Newham and it worked. So I said, actually, we've got to re- we, we've got to turn around the way we're doing planning. So that was my route from... Doing sales and marketing at first base, hanging around to see what I was was going to do next. So going, actually, this is a problem that I think I, I think I've got a solution for, and that was our solution was being very upfront, you know, building relationships early, and using those relationships to help us through the the, the significant challenge we had in all our schemes, which was around planning, um, and that, then that became my role. So I started to lead on our planning strategy effectively. How are we going to, you know, so, and also our acquisition strategy. So 
I stayed at first base and I stayed at first base for a decade actually. So we were at first base for over 10 years. Um, and in that time, I also went out to look at our outside of London projects. So I went out to Brighton to look for opportunities in Brighton. And similarly, everyone said, you will never get planning in Brighton. Brighton is a nightmare. Politically, it's, it's you know, it changes polit- politics every other, every other year. So it's really, it's a real issue. Um, and because, you know, Brighton is low rise, but it's near, it's got a C and a downs. Nobody wants hype, but that's the only thing you can do. So I said, okay, let's try our approach. So before we acquired the site, I went to Brighton because you know what it's like. We're looking at sites months and months in advance. So I went out to Brighton. I spent time in Brighton. I know Brighton at the back of my hand now. I was in the lanes. I was meeting with residents, with local people. I got to know everyone in Brighton. Literally, no exaggeration. I got to know lots of people in Brighton. But I got Brighton. I, I got under the skin also because it wasn't London. I know London so well, but Brighton was a completely new city. I got to know it really well. Again, aspirations, motivations, ambitions. What does it need? What are the issues? What are the problems? All of that got to it. So when we found a site... On the London Road. London Road. So we could go to the local authority and say, actually, we know what the challenges are. We know what your what your needs are. We know how... And we are. this is how we're going to address some of those issues. And what did we do? The council wanted... You know, at the time, Brighton was, you know, it's, it's still a... It's still a Green is that, it, it's, Or is it Labour now? At the time, it was Labour. It's, it's, it's now Labour again, but it was Green. It's yeah. now Labour as of like six, six months ago. But... The challenges Brighton has is that it doesn't have land to build lots of stuff because it's it's, it's sandwiched by the downs and the sea. Um, so it said we need to grow, we need to go taller, but we know it's it's a challenge locally to get people behind that. So how do we get people to understand the need to, the need to grow tall isn't a profitability thing is actually a need for the city. The city needs to grow to accommodate all the people who are here because there's not enough and there's not enough space. Um, but we've got to do it with quality. We've got to do it, you know, uh, you know, sensitively. And also we don't, we also want to continue to deliver the types of things like economic ec- space for people to work in. Because actually if you just build housing, Brighton will become a dormitory town. Everyone will come and live here, but jump on that very quick 45 minute train into London and there'll be the, 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 the economy of the city won't thrive. So we were like, okay, we'll deliver some commercial space alongside some residential space on this site. Um, and importantly, the site was across the road from um, uh, a beautiful park, you know, um, and the park had two trees, elm trees that were listed. Preston listed park. tree, Preston, Preston park, park, Preston Park, with the Preston Twins, elm trees that are listed. And the Preston Twins get a thousand visitors a year. People come and see the Preston Twins because they are two, the, the oldest elm trees, you know, and they, they, they manage to survive Dutch elm disease. Now, I knew nothing about trees, but I learned a lot about trees. In fact, I learned so much about trees. Me and the tree expert in Brighton were besties because that was a massive issue for our site. People, people were really worried that the scale of the buildings were overshadowed, would, would not let enough light onto the trees and the trees would, and we were like, no, one, we've designed it well, but I learned, I, I literally went to learn about trees just for that purpose. And now I could confidently have those conversations with local people and the Preston Park users group and say, guys, look, we've designed it and we can assure you we've done all the modeling and we can assure you that and that's the kind of stuff that you get into because you people if people are entrusting you with their space you've got to make sure you understand what their issues and their needs are so and then we did that in Brighton and in Brighton we got consent and everyone said you'd never get consent I remember going to that panel committee and we said we had opposition don't get me wrong but we got consent for it and and, and so going from okay we know I know London we can do it in London and going to another city and it working was a real light bulb. And I thought, actually, this is the bit I really enjoy because this is about, it is not about gaming the process at all. It's about building credible relationships with everyone. And it's not just planners, it's local residents, it's local businesses, it's local influence, local stakeholders, it's all those people, because what you're trying to do is help get everyone behind the need for something or the why, but also get their input into it. Like if you, if we all make this place what it it could be, it's, it's going to be a better place and get everyone behind that early. And then we go through the planning journey. And I know that by the time we get to the planning, sit in front of the planners, that's that, whatever we've, we've got up to is a really good, it's a good scheme that's supported by many people and, and the planners will support that. So that's kind of what I ended up doing. And I really enjoy it because it gives me the opportunity to continue to meet people, build relationships, engage, speak, which I love, but also there's an outcome. We're trying to get everyone behind a goal and deliver something that's going to be really meaningful. Have you, um, have you ever taken any formal property qualifications <laughs> and have you ever felt 
If the answer to that is no, yeah. have you ever felt that you need to, to fit in or mm-hmm. earn your place at the table in this real estate development world or not? I haven't. Um, I end up doing a BA and MA and I've done lots of like, you know, certificates, etc. But in, very early in my career, when I, I remember when I was working on Olympic Park, I felt really, really, um, I, I felt my, my confidence levels were quite low. And that's because I, I think I was surrounded by, I was learning new things and I didn't know anything about it. And effectively, everyone around me had gone, had, had done qualifications. They were either surveyors, they came from fund management background. They were, it, it was just, and I was completely, I had none of that. And I think one of the reasons why I didn't end up doing that was because my one of my colleagues, who's now my MD, he also didn't have the property qualifications. Barry. Yeah, Barry. And he always, and I always thought, well, actually, you know, he's worked in the industry longer than I have and he didn't do that. I don't think I'm going to do it. I'm going to stick to, stick to my guns as I, I am, I'm in property, but I don't need to, the quali- I don't need a qualification to, to feel like I need to, I need that to sit at the table. I think I could confidently do that without having that. And I've learned everything on a job. So I, I didn't feel I needed to. How, where do external consultants fit into to this and lean on external advice? Because you take a lot yeah. of ownership personally mm-hmm. to go and build these relationships and, and do the hard work needed. Um, where do yeah, external consultants fit in? They do. Um, but I think one of our strengths is that it's us. You get us. You know, I, I should have said, so f- um, after 10 years at first base, we decided to set up Socius. Yeah, I was yeah. going to come on. Oh, sorry. Gonna, yeah, so yeah, that's right. We'll come on to that. Um, but I think it's that that personal relationship for me is key. Um, I'm not a fan of sending a consultant out to go and build a relationship with someone if I think that relationship should be with me, because I think the credit, the, 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 the trust is built with you as a person. And I think once that's done, then it's like, okay, next month or two months later, Sally might come and meet you. But actually I think it's important for that person to know that I am the one responsible for this project. I'm the one who's accountable for it. And it's me. So we are, we take a very personal hands-on approach to our work, which, which don't get me wrong, it's very time consuming. And I, and I say that to investors, to my, to my colleagues, my team, the approach that we take is not, it's, it's time, it's time heavy. You know, it means you have to spend a lot of time out of the office, on the road and you know, having lots of conversations that sometimes might not re- not, might not reap the rewards immediately, but you've got to see it as an investment. You know, because it's an investment in the long term. I, I have had conversations with people in Southampton, in Bristol, and I have no projects in Southampton, but I know that I will at some point, and those conversations will be fruitful. So it's investing, and I think it is a my role. Not many organised, not many developers, development companies have my role. Um, because we see it as an investment. We see it as a, a key USP for our business to have that personal relationship with people rather than it being be kind of um, filtered through other people. So you, you touched on the transition from first base, mm-hmm. which is no longer trading as first base, to socius. Can you just talk to me about that? Yes, And of then course. talk to me a little bit about... Socius as a business mm-hmm. and how you classify what type of business it is. So I did 10 years at first base and absolutely, you know, it was where I learned everything that I, I, I know now. Um, and then about just before the pandemic, first base decided that they wanted to focus on the investment side mainly. Um, and most of us in the business were developers. We wanted to build, we wanted to see things happen. Um, so we decided, um, so myself and three other directors in, in, in first base decided to basically take all the developments out of first base and set up a new company. So we set up Socius. So Socius was set up as a, also as a mixed use developer. We wanted to, we started to use commercial in a lot of our schemes at first base. And we, we realized that actually residential was great, but we, it, when we are working in urban city centers, residential is not the only solution to the challenges we face. You know, as I mentioned in Brighton, Brighton needed homes, but you also needed to strengthen its economy. So, and we had the similar challenges in other places we're working in who are saying, we really need homes, but actually we need jobs. We need people to work here and spend money locally and grow this local economy. Um, so we decided that actually becoming a mixed use, mixed use developer was, the, was how we could address some of those challenges in urban city centers. Um, and we're really lucky when we set up Socius, we had 
we already had existing projects that we took with us. So we had our Bristol project, our Milton Keynes project with us already and our Brighton project. Um, but since then, we're now two and a half years in, in operation. We've we acquired two projects in Cambridge, uh, which are working on with, with, with Railpen. We've just, um, we've just been um, appointed to work with Aviva Capital Partners on a scheme in Sutton, which is a cancer research and um, a drug facilities down, down in Sutton. Um, so it's great. We're re, you know, we've grown exponentially. As you mentioned, we're now 2.2 billion. We've got 2.2 billion pound GDV of, of work that we're working on. Um, so we've pivoted into a, a, a into a, 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 a company that's got scale, got really exciting projects. But I suppose a bit that I'm really, really proud of and the way we set up the company was we always wanted to focus on a bit that we all know we all got into property four. So me and my other directors, one of my directors comes from a housing association background, I mentioned Barry is, has a real mixed background. Um, and one of my other directors is a, um, is an architect. And, but we all jointly believe that, you know, we are doing this, not just because we want to build loads of lovely buildings, which we absolutely do, but actually back to that starting point about the people are the most important part of what we do. So that real people centric fo- focus is what we built the business on. So we started off saying, if we don't have any buildings, how, you know, the people, let's start with people. So we invest a lot of time in understanding that as we talked about the ambitions, that it's in, you know, what inspires people, what motivates them, what types of spaces do people like? Why would they want to live, work, play in these types of spaces? And that's what informs our, our the physical space that we create. And similarly, we don't, but you know, we we ha- we have a, a strong focus on social impact. Um, we, you know, we talk a lot about balancing profit and purpose because we we are absolutely a profit making business, but we, we also want to we also make a real focus on being purposeful. Like we don't just do things for the sake of it. We're thinking, how can we make this the best place? How can we make more impact? How can we encourage and, and support people to do more or to do things differently or to improve their life chances? So we're always thinking about those things and making decisions based on that. So that's a real, that's probably my, the, the bit that I'm proudest about the business because, you know, we can, we do all our really exciting projects, but those projects are only, you know, for me, they, they are successful because they deliver proper social impact into those communities. And we, you see it across all the things that we do. You know, we make decisions like, you know, we've got, you know, we, we've got a scheme in Cambridge of our, um, with Railpen. And that scheme is a three acre site, but we dedicated half of that site to a public park. Now, Cambridge land prices in Cambridge are not cheap, but that was a real purposeful decision because we wanted to make sure that not just things like sustainability, biodiversity, but, you know, Cambridge is a, is a really unequal city. It's one of the most unequal cities in the UK. The disparity between rich and poor is tragic. So how can we make small decisions like that? That you know, we've got, we, for example, we've got a um, uh, food growing uh, plant uh, hubs all across the site. We've got um, uh, we've got a community kitchen so people come and cook, pick food, cook, cook food. Those types of little decisions, which we didn't have to do, make a real difference in our local community and deliver proper social impact. So those types of things that we constantly think about: how do we make sure in the physical development we're doing it, but also broadly how do we provide jobs training a work experience you know all volunteering opportunities charity donations all of those for us is, is is part of everything that we do it's like the product the product market fit and where it where it all intersects with capital development and then the the user base at the end completely right? and, 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 and i think also we have a real role to m- encourage our industry to do more um when we started talking about social impact there was a little bit of an eye roll i think everyone's you know a few years ago there was a bit like oh here we go something else is, is it just csr isn't it and it's like no well, not really um this is about making decisions dif- making different types of decisions um so and we we, we went on the on a b corp journey and we're obviously b corp accredited um but a, part, a lot of lots of what we do and i do now is actually how do we encourage our, our, our everyone else to do the same thing because actually we can't just do it on our own it's all right if we are banging a drum and saying actually it's really important that as part of this project we're going to employ 50 50 you know neat people who are not in employment or training but actually if every every other person who's you know architects designers landscapers do do that we could exponentially grow that and that's really that's part of our real championing role this year to make sure we get as many people in our industry to see social impact as not just a nice thing to do but the, the right thing to do. I know you published the social uh, impact report as well. Yes, we do. Um, a, a, a question I was going to ask you in terms of designing, and you obviously do a lot of work up front to find these um, these opportunities and build the relationships. Has the has the relationship for the type of capital you go and 
pitch the deals to? Have, has that changed? Or um, I'm just trying to think in terms of the evolution of um, this cycle and awareness of capital trying to access these types of opportunities. Um, 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 that's a good question, actually. I think we're seeing a lot more institutional institutional investment coming in. And you'll see we've moved, we're, we're now working with people like Railpair and Aviva Capital Partners who take a longer term view. More pension fund Absolutely. capital. So much more patient capital, actually. Um, but we, we tend to work with medium and long-term capital because actually for us to deliver the type of things, the type of place that we're talking about, it needs to be medium term. You know, we can't, build, sell, run, build, sell. That, that that cycle is just too, the pace of it is too quick. And actually, you know, when we talk about, we've got to be patient with it. I mean, we've got to build a relationships, acquire the space, go through planning. But we're not talking about years. We're just talking about giving the time for, this, for the place to kind of become a proper place. So we definitely work much more with medium and longer term capital now, for sure. Talk to me about, uh, I just want to go back into a point you kind of touched on a few minutes ago. Talk to me about the diversity in your team mm-hmm. and how you've gone about building a um, high-performing um, culture with people from different backgrounds mm-hmm. without it being kind of very linear in terms of the path or, or entry into real estate that they've had. Oh, that's a really good question. And it's something that we you know we're, we're constantly talking about, actually, because some people lose lots of personality ways, you know, personality met- metrics to do this. And I think for us, we're always thinking about, um, you know, the, the culture of the team. One of the things that is fundamental to us is this social impact, social impact approach. You know, we all genuinely believe in it. It's not a tick box. It's not a, oh, it's a nice thing to do. So, you know, f- from the offset, we're going, actually, you know, we did our, every year on our anniversary, we all do a, a corporate volunteering day. We spend an hour, you know, six hours wrapping presents, another four hours in a, in a park. But actually, you have, to, you have to believe that there's a reason for that. It's not just a nice thing to do. So, so just basic fundamental things like that is really important to us. So we're, you know, when we're coming into the business, we're asking you, what else do you do? You know, it's not just, oh, I, I volunteer at my local kid's school. It could be that, but we encourage people to do things outside of work. Um, but that, so for me, that's really important because it gets you to, it gets you to understand how how people see the importance and the value that people place on social impact. It's really important to us. But anyway, besides that, we um we take a real different approach to our, the way we bring people into the business or the way we nurture people in the business because what we're trying to what we're trying to encourage is a is diversity of thought and diversity of ideas. We don't want everyone to think the same. We we really like challenge. Um, and we talked earlier on about squiggliness. We like people to be squiggly in their approach to their career. Um, we all, you know, you don't ha- you don't have to move from you know being an associate director to a director to then it's fine if you if you're just an associate director or if you just be- it, it doesn't matter. We're not fixated on job titles. We actually say what do you want what do you, what do you want your job title to be? If you want it to be fine, you can have it because that's not the point. The point is what you do and the purpose that you deliver is more important. Um, and people really buy into that purpose. So we're really, we're re- our, our job is always trying to hone that idea of what does that mean for you? And we, we have a big focus on continuous learning, encouraging people to learn and learning, not in a, I've got to go and do a CPD or I've got to go and do, make sure I go. It's actually, you know, get on a train and go to Brussels and go and look at what's happening there. That's learning or go and sit in a community hall with 50 people who have gone through, who are refugees and have challenges in terms of housing in the UK and go and learn, what does that mean? Is that is that a new area that we should be looking into supporting? That's, that's, that's what we call learning. So we're always encouraging learning and taking the time out to focus on that. So we don't have, a, our structure is very, um, it's, it's very squiggly intentionally because we're not trying to put people into roles. We're trying to get people to kind of build the role as, as, as it's needed around them. But as you can imagine, in development, you need, you need, you need the PMs, you need the development directors, you need those functions, but we almost go, you're that plus all these other things that are also really important to the business, but also for you to develop yourself. Amazing. How would you, how would you, what roles and responsibilities fit under your remit in terms of what, what you, what you look at? If I can try and box you yeah. or oh, pin God. you of sorts. I'm one of those, I'm one of those people. Major reminder yeah. of them, I'm, one, I'm a bit of a Jane of all trades, um, which I always, which actually used to make me feel, sometimes I get, uh, I used to get really uncomfortable with that because, you know, you kind of, oh, Jack and all trades, master of nothing. Um, and I used to think, oh, should I just have a funk, like be some, like have a niche. Very, exactly. Be really niche. focused on something. And I realized that I just can't do that. I don't, I don't have an ability to do just one thing. 
it's it just too curious yeah I, I I just I I I get bored very easily. I like to do lots of things. So at the moment, I pick up quite a lot of things across the business, but it's by choice because I really enjoy them. So you mentioned I I I lead on on our relationship. So if there is a relationship to be built, it's going to be me. I'm the one who's going out and trying to figure out. You know, you know. For example, I'll give you an example. I might say. You know, I've looked at the top 10 cities in the UK in terms of, you know, whether it's housing stats or economic growth. And I think we should be we should be looking at these three cities for the next year. That's the kind of stuff I'll do. So I'll go out and I'll build a relationships in those cities. So I, I mentioned for example, Southampton. I might go to Southampton and go, right, who are the key people in Southampton? Who are the key decision makers? Who are the key influencers? How can I meet them? Where am I going to meet them? Where are the conversations? What conversation do I have to have with them? What do I want to uh, learn from them? And then I use that as my, you know, as, as, as tools for me to then go, right, if I am going to invest in Southampton, for example, where are the best, like, well, what am I looking at? And who else do I need to, who I, else I need on that journey with me? So I build a relationship. That's, that's, that's something that I really enjoy because it's learning. It's finding, finding out new things. It's engaging with people. And I, I, I always kind of challenge myself because people think, oh, there are some people who just can't build relationships. I'm like, Try, <laughs> try, try you know, and I don't, you know, I, 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 you, there's so many tools in a box. And I think, you know, we are, at the, I always say at the end of the day, we're all human beings fundamentally. So whether you, whatever it is, it's irrespective of your title, your role, your, you know, what it is, you're going to like one of many things, right? You just got to figure out what you like and have a conversation about it. So, or what you don't like, you know, you might go, hey, Arsenal. So I'm, we can have a whole conversation about that. So I think it's really important to, find ways to connect with people because when you relationships are key for me to everything you know you, you don't work with people who you just don't want to work with you're more likely to work with people who you, who you at least have a conversation with um so that's that's a big part of my job and f- and that helps to unlock opportunities so a lot of the opportunities we look at are unlocked as a result of those relationships or if they're not unlocked by relationships they are they are they are assisted by those by opportunities and completely. that's whether that's deals Capital, uh, exactly. Development opportunities that hundred percent, hundred percent. And I, there's, you know, Sutton. I was, we, I've been talking to Sutton for the best part of three years. I've been visiting Sutton, going there, having conversations, having lots. Of, and I can't say it helped, but when we 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 had we went through a proper competitive process on it, and it all worked. But I knew that place really well by the time I, I entered into that dialogue. Everyone else probably going, oh, let's figure out this place. What works? I was like, I know everyone. I've had these conversations. I've been in those coffee shops. I've met local businesses, local. I know what the challenges are so I was coming from an informed place and I think that's that's how I like to work um as I said you can't it doesn't if you're going through a, a proper process you're not trying to influence it but you're going in with the knowledge that everyone else probably is going to take it takes years to build that kind of knowledge up um so I look after that bit I kind of because of my comms and marketing background I still love that you know it's still kind of in me so I um one of the things that I do enjoy for the business is I which I do for the business I pick up all of our corporate um, comms. How do we? How are we perceived externally? All our external relationships. Um, so every how whenever you see socius mentioned, it's usually me who's su- we, obviously with support. But I look after that comes under me. I talked about our planning journey. So everything related to planning, I have got someone working with me who's amazing. Um, but I I I'm setting a strategy. So when we are about to embark on a project, we're going. What's what, what's what's the journey? Who who are we influencing? Where's the map? What do we need to do? All of that, and then social impact as well. You know, how do we continue to push from a social impact perspective? Um, B Corp. So I, I ran our B Corp accreditation. So how do we continue to push on that? And how do we continue to do things different? And as I said, a big driver for us is how do we get other people now to do more, so that it's, we were we are one of many people who are growing this real social impact focus. So yeah. What does 2024 look like for you and the Socius business? 2024 is going to be so exciting for us. We are, I mean, we've started with a bang. We have three projects that are going to be starting on site, so which is awesome. So we are all gearing up for those and, you know, which is, you know, game changing. You know, it's like you acquire a site, get it through planning. Now you can see it physically being built. So that's really exciting. Um, we are embarking on our, um, our first life sciences opportunity in Sutton. So we'll be taking, we'll be designing that, consulting with people, engaging bits that I love. So I'll properly, even though I've got a team, I'll get hands on on that. because I want to go and talk to everyone and understand those. So we'll get through that. Um, so we'll, we'll submit an application later on this year for that. Um, we will, we'll have another social impact conference because we, we're now Corp accredited. So we want to go out and share some interesting stories from our partners about who's doing what. Um, there's, yeah, so there's, there's a, it's going to be a busy year. It's going to be a really busy year. And I'm really looking forward to 
building more relationships in 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 places because we are we're still acquiring. We're looking to acquire a few more opportunities this year. So I'm looking forward to building those relationships to help support that. What advice would you give to um, someone who's early on in their career, who's looking out in the abyss thinking real estate is a, is a tiny market, but it's massive at the same time. There's so many different routes. Um, I'm overwhelmed with the opportunity there. What, what advice would you give someone early on who's trying to navigate things? Um, one of the things I would say is don't get fixated with the bricks and mortar because everyone else is so you know be a different voice in a room um which i think is helpful um i would say don't necessarily want to don't necessarily go down a very linear route into into real estate it's ha- it's okay to take a that squiggly route as we talked about before um but also um understand the real purpose of it you know we can get very focused on you know the the, oh, I'm working, you know, if you're in finance and it's always oh, a model review, I'm looking at the lines on a model. If it's a, if it's, if you're in survey, you're talking about the asset, but actually just remember that there's a, there's, there's a, the human side of real estate. And I think that's what keeps you in it. That's definitely what's kept me in it. So try and focus on that part. For selfish, that's what I love. And I think that will really give you some, give you the purpose that you're looking for in real estate. Amazing. Well, look, as we draw to, to a close, the question that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast is, if I gave you £500 million worth of capital, who are the people? What property and which place would you look to deploy cool. that capital? Good question. Um, I think one of, one of my areas that's really fascinating me at the moment is around just intermediate housing. Um, I think we've we've had a, f- a few challenging years of you know cost of living crisis, lots of challenges, and I think there's this kind of squeezed middle of people. And I have lots of friends who are teachers, nurses, doctors who are earning a good wage, but they really struggle with just getting you know whether it's on a housing ladder or just being able to you know there's no properties for them because it's social rent or it's you know, high value housing and having, you know, I, I was having a really good chat recently with, you know, uh, Livia from Dolphin Living about key worker housing, actually. And it's something that we used to do many years ago, but it seems to have fallen by the wayside. So I think I'd invest in that because you're investing in people who are servicing our cities. They are, you know, and I, when I work in places like Cambridge and Bristol, there are people who work in a hospital who can't afford to live in a city and they're commuting miles. And those, those are people who are keeping us healthy. They're keeping our streets clean. They're keeping our societies running. And I think having some, building a good quality stock of intermediate housing that supports people who are just, who just want to, who just want to, they're going to do good for our community um, is what I put my money into. Any people that you'd bring along the journey? Oh, loads. My team. They're awesome. So Outside my team. of your team? Uh, oh, my t- I, oh, there's, there's too many to it's name. Too, there's too, too many, many to, to name. name. But okay, I definitely, but... I bring my team along and I'd bring some inspirational people along. I mentioned Dolphin Living. I love Alex Note from PFP. She's always inspires me every time I speak to her. You know, so yeah, lots of really interesting people. Sophie from Aviva Capital. Yeah, some really good people. I just realized I mentioned a lot of ladies, but yeah, you know, I love my ladies squad. So we'll do that. And in terms of place across the UK? Across the UK. But I think some of those, I, I think our, 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 our major towns and cities need that injection because they have, they, they've seen that polarization. So I think some, you know, major cities will be where I'd put my money in. Well, you've had a phenomenal career. I think you touched on earlier the fact that you're not good at sales. I think you've got that completely wrong. I think you're phenomenal at sales. No. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, you get right to the heart of what the issues that people face. You really uh, are very curious and you try and learn. Uh, and then you create, uh, you and the team, phenomenal product that serves those communities. And um, I'm really, really excited to see what you and the team go on to build. And I'm really appreciative of you coming on the podcast and no doubt inspiring other people who, who haven't had that traditional route um, that you can, um, with curiosity, a lot of hard work, sticking your hand up in uncertain situations, go really, really far and have an amazing impact uh, in this fascinating real estate uh, landscape that we find ourselves. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed our chat. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like, or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations and guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. 
The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website, www.rockborn.com, where you'll be able to find a wealth of information. Or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are, and I look forward to catching you next time.